Thanks, everyone, and welcome to the third session of our Discovery Day. We've got three fantastic speakers lined up for you today. And what I want to make sure is you hear as little from me as possible and as much from them as possible. The format will be that each of our speakers will give a 15 minute talk, uh, one, one after another. And then at the end of that 45 minute period, I'll invite them to come to the front and we'll take questions from audience members, but also from our online audience as well, uh, so that we can interrogate our speakers about what they've said to us. So I hope you listen keenly and you enjoyed the, this session. We're going to start today with uh, Professor Mike MacDonald, who's our Chair of uh, Biomedical Photonics and works in the School of Science and Engineering here at the University. So Mike did his first degree in laser and photoelectronics at uh, the University of Strathclyde before moving to Bern in Switzerland to undertake an MSc and a PhD. After that, he moved to the University of St Andrews, where he was a postdoctoral fellow and won an extremely prestigious fellowship, which was an EPSRC Advanced Fellowship. These are hugely competitive, and people who win these are truly amongst the very best of academic scientists in the UK. And it's great credit to us that in 2007, in order to facilitate the link between Mike's interest in laser physics, biomedicine, and biological sciences, that he moved here. Uh, to, to study at the or to work at the University of Dundee and he's now the director of research in our Centre for Medical Engineering and Technology at the University. So it's absolutely fantastic to have Mike talk to us today and the title of his talk is Tractor Beams and Sonic Screwdrivers. Over to you Mike, thanks very much. Engineering, um, you can find me just about anywhere in this university <laughs> in reality. Um, I don't necessarily see myself as being pigeonholed in any specific school, but solving problems that are very interdisciplinary and um, the solutions coming from all kinds of places as well as the problems from different places. So I've specifically mentioned School of Medicine here because a lot of the work that I will show was done with the School of Medicine um, and a lot of the applications are there, but I also have labs and work with people in life sciences um, and out at James Hutton Institute, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So and that's just the local stuff. Um, this title has boiled down to tractor beams and sonic screwdrivers, which make it sound like it's all going to be fun and about toys. Um, there are, is a little bit more to it than that. Um, I'll also be talking about laser worms as well, so it's not all going to be fun and games. Um, but to sort of go back to this idea of what, you know, if I'm talking about sonic screwdrivers and tractor beams, obviously we're talking about science fiction when we come to those. But there's different ways you can look at this. One is, um, the science fiction is inspiring the science. Um, the other is that the science is inspiring the science fiction. In reality, what you'll get here today is a big mix up of all of those different things. So we have built things in the lab, which we have then subsequently realized are most easily described as being something like a tractor beam or a sonic screwdriver. But we also have to confess that we're science fiction geeks at times as well. And we think, hang on a minute, we could build a sonic screwdriver. So we do that. Um, but all of these things have some kind of other output or impact beyond um, just the physics driven curiosity, which of course curiosity driven um, science and uh, for a physicist is actually a perfectly legitimate thing. But all of these things are actually driven by the applications, because as Blair has pointed out already, the reason I moved to Dundee was to be able to have the right people to collaborate with, to work with um, my stuff in, in uh, laser physics. Now, I'm talking about sonic screwdrivers as well, so that's not just going to be about optics, it's also going to be about sound. Um, and I'm going to start off with a picture of something that's neither, which is a surface wave on some water. And the reason for starting here is because it's all something that you're super familiar with. Um, in this case, we have a nice little um, source in the middle, which is bobbing up and down, possibly because something got dropped in the water there. Um, and then we have waves um, sort of emanating out from that. This is a two dimensional wave because it's just on a surface, um, but we can create these kind of waves in all kinds of different ways as well. And it's how we manipulate those waves and create those waves and then focus them, et cetera, that gives the properties of, of, of that we're looking for that allows us to build things like sonic screwdrivers. So if we take a bunch of waves here, this is just a few waves. Um, these might be rays of light, for example. We focus them down onto a single spot. That's effectively the same thing as you saw on the previous page. So that's our circular waves 
in reality, we live in a three-dimensional world. Our laser beams are going to be three-dimensional. So this is actually a spherical wave. So we're looking at a cross-section of a spherical wave there. Um, that is basically a description, a, a sort of an approximation, at least, of what you have if you just focus a laser beam down. So it's, again, its proper name is it's a, it's a Gaussian beam, um, but certainly away from the focus in particular, it can be described just as a spherical wave. Now, if we, rather than have lots of waves all focusing to the same point, but from different angles, we have them all fo focusing to the same line at the same angle, what we end up with rather than spherical waves is we have conical waves. And if we then look at the cross section of the beam that we would have, say, if we made this with light, then it looks like this. This is called a Bessel beam simply because it's a Bessel function, which is the mass that describes the shape of it. Um, but if you look at the center part here, this is actually like a, a pencil of light. So it's what we call non-diffracting. It stays this small spot as you focus it through things. Um, and that has lots of useful um, applications. We can go a little bit more sophisticated. We can make spiral beams. So these are much more difficult. You can't make one of these out on the surface of some water, for example. Um, but the idea here is that these are still the waves. And that this is what you're seeing here is just like those spherical waves and conical wave fronts. But in this case, they're, they're spirals. Um, because they're, you tried to have three, three different wave fronts at once in this case there, that actually leads to destructive interference or means you can't really have any light there. So these beams actually have dark holes in the middle, sometimes called donut beams. So again, this is like a laser beam with a dark hole through the middle, effectively. And that has some interesting properties. We can also do something quite simple, which is to take this beam over here, make it really astigmatic. Those of you like me that have astigmatism in their eyesight might know that that comes from the misshape of your, of your eyeball. So if we actually have a misshapen optic, which doesn't, isn't spherically symmetric, we can create um, instead lines of light rather than spots of light. Um, so that allows us to create light sheets. And these are all the kinds of beams, be they optical or um, ultrasound, um, that we'll be talking about in this talk. So to start off with, to describe how, about how do you make some of these um, sonic screwdrivers and tractor beams, the simplest way we can do this is to take one of these, um, I take laser, just focus it down. Um, we can then focus that onto a small object. And because light, if you remember your physics, has momentum in it, if we redirect that light with anything, this could happen at any scale, if we redirect that light in one direction, that change of momentum gives you an equal and opposite reaction to that, which creates a force on the object that's moved the light around. Now, these forces are super tiny. So if we take a fairly intense laser beam, focus it down, it's going to be less than a, a billionth of, of a Newton or 10 billionths of a kilograms worth of, of force. Um, but at the micron scale, so the scale of cells, for example, um, that creates a large enough force to move things. And you can see this in this example, this is a five micron or five millionths of a meter wide polymer sphere sitting in some water. We focus the laser down on it like that and we can move it around. Um, unlike some of the videos you see in this talk, this one's real time. So this is me just playing around and moving a laser around with a, with a mirror. Um, this was taken about 20 year, years ago or, or more. Um, but this, this uh, kind of science only just got the Nobel Prize about three or four years ago um, for this kind of stuff. You can actually create this in a microscopic form by instead of using light, you can just use water. So a slightly crazy um, collaborator of mine from uh, Illinois Wesleyan University in the States did this with a fire hose, point the fire hose up in the, in, into the sky and you can trap balls in that fire hose. And you can try this at home in a slightly less spectacular way. <laughs> if you just run a bath and put a ball in your bath, put the ball near the tap where the water pours into the bath, the ball will get trapped in the, in the flow of water from there. As long as you don't turn it on too hard anyway, it will do that. And you can even just about feel that with your finger if you have a fairly fast running tap and you put your finger into the water, it will pull it in. And that's what we're doing with light except this only really light only works down at the micron scale, but then that's great because we need tools to work down at the micron scale. We can do something a bit more sophisticated. We can take five of those simple beams, overlap them. They create an interference pattern, which then creates an array of these spots of light instead. So this is just a cross section, two dimensional cross section, um, but this is actually a three dimensional lattice of light. Um, we can then trap things in that, in this case, this is a simulation of magnetic spheres being trapped in that. 
and they're going to every other spot because they're repelling each other at the same time as being trapped in this um, optical array. Um, but this is no more complicated in reality. It's just an optical version of eggs sitting in an egg box effectively. So they're feeling a potential energy landscape, which we're creating in that case with optics, but you can also create it using gravity and an egg box. And in this case, um, physicists here will see that we have egg-egg interactions that are stopping us from having more than one egg in any one trap. <laughs> so uh, that all sounds fun, but we can actually do useful stuff with this as well. Um, for example, we can sort balls. We then haven't actually done this as an experiment, but if you were to take a roof like this, corrugated iron roof, and the roofer has gone a bit crazy that day and he's laid it across the fall line so it's diagonal instead of going straight up and down, you put a bunch of balls at the top of that, you release the balls. The tennis balls, in physics speak, get kinetically locked into the roof. The footballs roll over the top and you've sorted your balls. Now, of course, nobody really needs to sort tennis balls from footballs, so that's not a great bit of impact. Um, however, we can create the same sort of pattern with light. We're doing this down at the scale. This pattern's about 40 microns across. We can then put red blood cells in there. In this case, I've sort of done a cartoon of, of fully differentiated erythrocytes, which are red blood cells that no longer have a nucleus, and they're sort of um, precursor, which is um, ha still has its its nucleus there. And this, we had we had a reason for wanting to do this, which is that we we're trying to produce an industrially produced um, red blood cells for the um, blood transfusion service. But we kept getting this problem of it, of having lots and lots of of nucleated cells still in there, which will then not actually work in the way that we want. So that is one of the stages that was quite difficult to get right in that process. So we needed to have some sort of quality control way of doing this. If you let these go, what the red blood cells do is they flip up to align with those grooves of light. If you let those go, in this case, it's not gravity pulling them through, it's just a flow of fluid going through this pattern, and we can sort those. So obviously that's a little bit more useful than sorting um, balls. Uh, this video at the side is just uh, from the original paper that we did on this, but it shows um, in real time how we can sort different sizes in that case rather than different shapes is the main thing we're sorting um, for. But I promised tractor beams, so I'm going to have to give you tractor beams. Um, this is where we come back to this idea of these conical waves. Um, and it's very much the conical wave nature that allows us to make a tractor beam. Now, there's lots of things we've done in the past that the media have picked up on as being tractor beams, which has been helpful because it gets you lots of um, sort of attention. But then we had this question of what really is a tractor beam? And we, so we decided we're going to try and make one. In this case, rather than doing it with optics, we did it with ultrasound because in that way we can manipulate large things so we can see things in, in sort of macroscopically. So we made an acoustic vessel beam, um, but to make the tractor beam, unfortunately, you can't just have one tractor, you need two tractors. Um, and this is, it, this is our conical beam here. So the sort of the energy is coming from the two different angles. This creates a vessel beam up here. And as I said, we did this with ultrasound and you can see the stripes in the middle there are the vessel function of that vessel beam that's created in the middle by focusing two ultrasound sources, one out here and one out here, to meet in the middle there. There's lots of ripples in there because remember we're working with waves and they're all interfering with each other. But so long as the part, this object here is sort of down in this area here, the energy hits the back of it, gets directed upwards, and that pulls the object towards you. And that gave us our definition for a tractor beam, which is a an attraction against a net momentum flux in physics, which basically means if you fire something at something rather than pushing it away, it comes towards you. So that was our bit of fun. Um, there are reasons for doing this and I'll come on to it in, in a minute, it's not just fun. Uh, here we have my old PhD student, Zheng Yi, with a real sonic screwdriver and Dr. Hu with a fake sonic screwdriver. Um, <laughs> uh, and BBC came to speak to us about this. This is our spiral beams. So these beams, when we make them, look like uh, donuts. There was some genuine physics behind this. One of the reasons we did this was actually to establish the relative amounts of orbital angular momentum to linear momentum in both sound and light. But you can't really do it in light because that ratio is, is so ridiculously tiny or large, depending how you look at it. Um, but you can see here, these are the spirals that we programmed into the ultrasound source. It creates, this is a simulation, this it creates these donut beams. This is what we actually got. 
we got phase that looks like this. You can see the spirals and you can see the dark cores in there. So we were able to create the or use what are effectively optical holographic techniques to program ultrasound transducers. And you say, well, how did we do this? Well, we did something a little bit unusual. Normally what you do is you do some physics and you translate it into medicine. We took this nice um, approved um, focused ultrasound surgery um, robot with a, um, a transducer array on the end. And we reprogrammed to this to do some physics. Now, in doing that, we learn a heck of a lot more about how to control these beams. So that's sort of our real motivation for doing it. But this is an MR compatible robot with an MR compatible thousand element ultrasound array in it, which is here. And this is our sonic screwdriver. This entire bed underneath it is the power source for it. So it's not quite so portable as your as Doctor Who's sonic screwdriver. This is a video of it working. Um, there's a card that came in and out there very fast that said L, L equals one. That means there's only one spiral in here. So when it lifts up and starts to spin because the sonic screwdriver is down here, it spins very slowly. But we can put as many spirals into there as we want within reason. Um, and then we can get more and more angular momentum in there and spin things faster and faster. So in doing this, what we've actually done is we've developed better holographic techniques for doing things like correcting wave fronts, creating a focus like a Bessel beam within, for example, the brain for delivering um, therapeutic doses um, to tissue through highly scattering and, and sort of aberrative materials. So that's all the manipulation stuff or mostly manipulation stuff done for now. Very quickly go through some uh, imaging instead. So we have a light sheet. What we can do is we can focus that down through our sample, creates an optical section through that sample. We then take another lens out here to image that. There'll be a camera out here to take that image. Um, that creates a section through our sample. In this case, the sample is a chick embryo. Um, and if we then take thousands of these sections, which creates several terabytes worth of data, we can transform that to look at this from any angle through any section we like, just like in computer tomography. Um, you can see the body axis of the chick embryo be, um, being de um, developing there. And what this is, is it allows us to create these huge data sets, massive images of, of things like chick embryos. Um, this, if we zoom right in, it's this, this is part of a whole image of an entire chick embryo, just one section through it. We can see all the individual cells. This is using fluorescence, and in this case, the cell membranes are fluorescent. So we can do that because we're, we have the optical sectioning. It gives us high contrast, but it also gives very low light dose. That low light dose means that we can work with live samples. So we can create videos of this happening and you can see the flows of tissue in, in the chick embryo here as this body axis is laid down. Um, we can also do this with plant roots. Um, the video on the right hand side is showing bacterial density around the plant root. The left hand side here is uh, the transparent soil that we developed to allow us to image the plant roots in situ. If you pour water into this transparent soil, the soil effectively disappears as far as you can see. We then have our light sheet in there. In this case, we're illuminating from both sides. We image from the, from the, from at 90 degrees again. We take lots of sections. We get our um, plant root imaged. But simultaneously, well, this is done just by the scattering of light off the, off the root. We can also make the soil fluorescent so we can still see the soil. The bacteria in this case are fluorescent at a different um, wavelength of laser again, so we can simultaneously um, but independently image three different things and that allows us to look at how the bacteria interact with the plant root in this case. A very final bit of science, because um, I've slightly overrun here already. Um, how do those bacteria get in? Well, they, one of the ways to do it is by, via damage. That damage might be caused by nematode worms. Um, but if you want to wait for an nematode worm to make that damage, you could be there for a very long time. Um, so we use lasers to cut holes in, in uh, plant roots, never this big when we're doing the experiment because that's not what nematode worm would do. Um, but that then allows us to look where do the bacteria go on that root. They go to these sources of this, this damage, which is something that people didn't, weren't able to see before. We can even cheat and make sure the bacteria go where we want by using these optical manipulation and tra trapping techniques. And we take guide individual bacteria to the wound site to see what they do when they get there. And then that allows us to see, are they being attracted and getting in at wound sites? Or actually, are they just interested 
in this image here that um, PhD student Jing Shui made of all the bacteria just accumulating at the, the end of the route. And that's me. Um, these are just lots of people to thank because there are a huge number of people involved in this. These are just the sort of the key people, um, some photos of them and more people mentioned over here and all the main um, uh, funders as well, because none of this comes for free. Um, and I will leave it the last word to the, the worms, the, the laser worms themselves. And thanks very much. Thank you for that tour de force, and we'll come to questions later on. I'm now going to invite Jill Milner, who was the winner of our Best Advisor Personal Tutor Award and the Outstanding Commitment to Student to Student Welfare Award in 2022 as part of our Student-Led Teaching Awards. So Jill is a, a child nurse. She's a lecturer here at the university, and she's done a lot of work, um, particularly during the pandemic, as a nurse educator to help our students through a very difficult time. Many of you will not necessarily know that throughout the pandemic, our nurses played an absolutely phenomenal role coming out of their study period, out of their study pattern and going into the NHS to take up employment to support the NHS when so many staff in the NHS were, were ill. Not only our nurses, but our young doctors did the same. So Jill has played an integral role in helping those students through that process. And it's really something that I know Ian and I, you know, university is hugely proud of is what those students did. So it's an absolute delight to have Jill as an expert in this area to give us our talk. Let me put the right glasses on to get the right title. And Jill is going to give a talk, which is, we were just doing our job. Jill, over to you. So it's a great pleasure for me to come to speak to you today um, about my experience of being relatively new lecturer in child nursing just as the COVID pandemic hit. I'd like to stress, unlike what Blair said, that this is not just my story, but this is the story of the School of Health Sciences, of other nursing academics and crucially professional services and students as well. Um, if we go forward quickly to when the um, COVID pandemic mercifully receded in June 2022, I was lucky enough to be nominated and to win two student awards. And I remember saying to a colleague at the time, it seems a bit weird because I was just doing my job. And she said to me, I think it was how you did your job that has perhaps made the difference. And that got me thinking about how myself and my colleagues did our job through this national crisis. Indeed, over the past two years, the global spotlight more than any other time has arguably been really focused and intensely focused on our healthcare workforce and by default, our future healthcare workforce. But I realise that perhaps the story of uh, those who worked behind the scenes in um, education was not fully understood as we tried to maintain the education of the future workforce and at the same time, and really importantly, retain the future workforce in an NHS that looked increasingly frightening to our students um, and it wasn't really what they thought they had signed up to. So when the WHO, the World Health Organization, declared we were in a pandemic on the 11th of March 2020, the current situation in the School of Health Sciences was that we had a mix of adult mental health and child nursing students across three years and two campuses, including our Kirkcaldy campus. Depending on the year of study that the students are at, it's set, the sort of clinical uh, proficiencies are set by our governing body, the Nursing and Midwifery Council. And they vary widely from in year one where students are just really finding their feet in the clinical environment and they're working under very close supervision to year two when they're beginning to develop their independence and demonstrating that they're becoming more competent and confident in their roles as future nurses. And then finally, in the independent stage in year three, where supervision takes a more indirect form and students are expected to demonstrate and to lead and to coordinate care and begin to act as an accountable practitioner. Indeed, towards the end of year three, we're really looking for our students to be exhibiting true kindness and compassion, as well as the skills and proficiencies and competencies worthy of going on to the nursing register. It was 
in the third year, second and third year rather, that the NMC introduced uh, emergency standards and looked to universities such as Dundee and our student body to help support the crisis, resulting in Dundee University sending out 516 students to help with the COVID effort. For nursing academics like myself and others and professional services, this meant making sure all of those students were suitably risk assessed, they were mentally and physically well enough to go into practice and um, we worked very closely with our clinical colleagues as we guided them before they were fully qualified in the skills of being nurses. In addition, we continued to teach other students the theory component part of their training, ensuring that our students are evidence-based in their practice, have a sound knowledge and are able to cope with modern day nursing. And a high priority at that time was intense pastoral care, trying to retain our new students who had just come into university. As we will also remember, a state of national lockdown was also declared at this time. And for many of us, I think this image represents life at that time, especially for those of us, of us who were working. And we began to move everything online, literally leaving us often holding the baby, both metaphorically and physically. In addition, our professional services and senior staff were faced with a deluge of emails from the Nursing and Midwifery Council, from the health boards, from universities, and of course, from Scottish government, as well as multiple emails from concerned staff and students. And it is to their credit that they put processes and systems in place with calm, kind efficiency in recognition of the stress that all staff and students were under at that time. However, if I'm truly honest, I'm sure you will all relate to this. We're often uh, swimming against a tide of ever-changing advice and ever-changing government policies. And I'm sure regardless of our role, we all felt a bit like this. So as stated, the, the pandemic forced universities to completely rethink their mode of delivery and managing the adjustment from face-to-face -face teaching uh, in an often hands-on practical course like nursing to delivering this virtually brought its own set of unique challenges, I believe. There was very little time to learn often new and unfamiliar technology or even the breathing space to think, is this effective for our students? Other lecturers like me, I'm sure, wondered and worried about this new, new mode of delivery asking ourselves questions like, is this suitable for the particular type of students where our hands-on face-to-face -face assessment of them as individuals in the classroom is crucial as we seek to understand if our students will cope with the harsh realities of nursing. We like to observe in class how they interact in a caring and respectful and compassionate manner with one another. And crucially for nursing, we observe in our class how their key communication skills are beginning to develop, develop. And we look for subtle changes in them, particularly around their well-being. So as a formerly chatty student in class beginning to become withdrawn, and we worry that if they cannot care for themselves, how will they then care for others? So that pastoral element we were concerned may get lost. And on a personal level, um, we really were concerned about the juggling of home life, caring responsibilities and notwithstanding challenges around digital literacy and access. Finally, importantly for nursing, we worried about the role modelling aspect of our job, which are all of our nursing lecturers hold dear. We're in the classroom, we, like, we get to know our students and hopefully role model values such as empathy, autonomy, accountability and curiosity. Ultimately, we try to take a kind and considerate approach while teaching often difficult and very emotive topics. We wondered about this role modelling aspect. Would this be lost in the rather cold, sterile online forum? In other words, in the context of nursing, would we be able to teach the very art of nursing without the value of human touch that is so intuitive to our, us all? The question of whether the online forum would suit the type of learners attracted to nursing has generated some 
debate in the liter nursing literature that was published both during the pandemic and subsequently. And although much is lit written in the literature about those attracted to nursing as being kinesthetic learners, so those who like to learn through hands-on contact in order to cement um, their knowledge base, reassuringly, a, a longitudinal study that was published in 2022 said that the learning styles of healthcare students aren't in fact static and they can move and flex alongside the teaching styles and that actually learning online would not have been that detrimental to them. In addition, the majority of our students are born after 1980 and are what are described in the literature, the net generation or digital natives, also supporting the notion that they would be able to move seamlessly online. Interestingly, as well, I guess there was a, there's a move in the literature to include more technology in nursing and some authors suggest that this was an inevitable pathway for nursing that the pandemic merely just accelerated. Additionally, there, it, other literature suggests that we should be critical altogether of learning styles and that if education becomes too wedded to a particular mode of teaching, then that will be restrictive to learning and that actually offering a variety of learning techniques is what they call the construction of learning and is much more effective. However, what is perhaps less well documented in the literature is what the nurse educator actually felt. So over the last few weeks, I've gathered some words from my colleagues at that time. The shift to online delivery was not without stress and many of us, myself included, questioned our role as we are all still on the nursing register and felt that we might have been more useful on frontline services. Undoubtedly, for most educators, the, pa the pandemic really marked a massive uh, learning curve for us. And although we rose to the challenge of, uh, of, of learning new innovation and growing our technical skills, these are some of the words that were captured by my colleagues, and I really thank them for their honesty. On the student side, some of the literature suggests that while some students enjoyed the flexibility of studying at home, other studies link this to increasing isolation in our student population and an increase in mental health problems. So what did we do to ensure a positive educational experience for our students? Well, our, myself and my colleagues, we quickly learned about online classrooms, about chat rooms, about blogs, about Mentimeter quizzes, Padlet boards, virtual rooms, group work, and all of the other innovative techniques that were available to us. We didn't always get it right and some students did decide to leave the course along the way, but I can hand on heart say that we did our very best to ensure the highest quality of education for our future nurses. And as the seasons passed, unexpectedly, we integrated fun in the best way we knew how through the bleakest of times. At various times and as COVID restrictions allowed, we managed to bring our students back into the clinical skills lab in Nine Wells, where we really honed down their fine clinical skills, reinforcing what they were learning in practice, enabling our students to learn those key clinical skills that all nurses must possess. But crucially, we have, were able to bring them together to learn together. And I'm happy to say that our then first years where we were able to get them back mostly to face-to-face -face teaching in their final year. And the vast majority of these students, this is my group, have now gone on to their future careers in the NHS. Many of them saying to me at graduation that their experience of training throughout the pandemic will forever bond them. I believe it is with good support net mechanisms around these students, including their family, their friends, their peers, their colleagues and the university, helping them to draw on their own strengths and resilience that help them to be practically ready, even when they maybe didn't feel that emotionally um, or educationally. As lecturers and professional services and advisors of studies, we made sure we were available to answer their questions, to meet with them as needed, to listen to them and ultimately treat them and our colleagues with kindness, both in word and in deed. 
We understood when students needed to seek assurance and we mopped up their tears when they felt lost and confused at the change in their university experience, their lives and often dramatic changes in their dreams of becoming a nurse. And we referred to the appropriate services when students were struggling and needed special mental health support. It is clear that the impact of the pandemic and the nursing education cannot be understated. In summary, through the pandemic, nurses have once again risen to the challenge to meet the communities they serve and nurse educators have cemented their commitment and service to students through creative and innovative educational practices. It was passion that led our students to the profession of nursing and it is a passion for our profession that has led us into education and it is passion that will sustain us through the most difficult of times. Only time will tell the long term impact on us all personally and professionally, but in the immediate future, I believe we owe our students a debt of gratitude and we have pride in them and our school and a promise to learn from this unique experience remembering the importance of being kind to one another. And it is clear so long as nurses and those who educate them continue to meet the challenges that our profession uh, faces, that we will emerge stronger and better for it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jill. Uh, I think you said we owe a debt of gratitude to our students, but I think I can say with hand on heart that we owe a debt of gratitude to the, all of the professionals who teach our students and look after them across the health sciences, across the School of Medicine and all of our, our professions because what you did during the pandemic was truly remarkable and the reason you got two awards was because of your contribution, so very well done. So I want to move on now to the third speaker in, in this series, in this session. And that's Professor Jack Hartman. Uh, welcome, Jack. Jack is the Chair of International Law and Human Rights here at the University in the School of Humanities, Social Sciences and Law. Jack is a real expert in this area, and we're very lucky to have him at this have him at our university. Um, he did a PhD at the University of Cambridge. He's an acknowledged expert in his field. He has taught at Edinburgh, he's taught at, Edin at, at Durham, he's taught in Glasgow, and he's currently a, visit currently a visiting academic in Bogota in Colombia at the University of La Sabana, which I've actually visited, interestingly. <laughs> and um, so, you know, his international reach is, is really great. I think it's important to realise then, you know, we heard from Mike earlier about applications of what he does to real life situations. Jack isn't just a, an academic studying international human rights law. Jack was a legal officer at the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, representing Denmark at diplomatic conferences and before the International Court of Justice. So what Jack does academically has application in both the diplomatic and political uh, service. So it's great to hear from Jack today and the, talk, the title of his talk of The End Times of Human Rights. Welcome Jack. <laughs> So I learned from my old professor many years ago. He started a lecture once by saying, the last thing I did last night was to print my lecture. The last thing I should have done was to put it in my briefcase. And <laughs> then he continued giving an absolutely brilliant lecture anyway. But I have started putting it on my laptop. So as Blair just said, I've recently been promoted uh, to professor of international law and human rights. And I've been here at Dundee University for the last 10 years and for the last or for the next 10 minutes or so, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my research and what impact that research has. Um, the title of my presentation is rightly the end times of human rights. And there's a question mark in the title. And that's quite important because I'm not going to tell you whether or not human rights are going to end. Uh, and I really hope it won't, uh, partly because I think we all need it and also because I like my job, of course, um, so. <laughs> but I can tell you today that human rights is under a lot of pressure uh, and there's no need to take my word for it because this morning, Human Rights Watch, which is an NGO, published its world report for 2023, where it considers, this is a yearly report where it considers the status of human rights around the world. Now, I got up early, but I didn't get up early enough to read all 712 pages. Uh, but what I did read was not particularly cheerful. So the report talks of a litany of human rights crisis in 2022, 
from Russia's deliberate attacks on civilians in Ukraine, on China's open air prison of the Uyghurs in China, to the Taliban's putting millions of Afghans at risk of starvation, and of course, which is very close to the heart of many people here, preventing women in Afghanistan from going to university. But human rights are not just a danger in faraway places. It's always easy to point the fingers to the other and say they're not complying with the rules. Human rights are also under pressure in the UK and in other European countries. So again, if we look at the report that was published this morning, Yasmin Ahmed, who is the UK Director of Human Rights Watch, said that last year we saw the most significant assault of human rights protection in the UK for decades. And she continued, fundamental and hard-won rights are being systematically dismantled. Now, you might ask, what has all this got to do with a newly minted professor in Dundee? Well, one of the things I do is I teach human rights law to students and I also research on the topic and of course I publish on the topic. Now, when I say I do research on law, I'm often met with a blank stare. So uh, maybe in particular in a university that's very famous for its uh, life sciences and medicine and nursing and so on. But I don't have any fancy slides of laser worms or I can't tell you about fantastic jobs that the nurses did under the COVID. In fact, um, I just have my words basically to try to explain how I do research uh, on human rights law and how that research also makes an, an impact in the world. Um, and some people think that Doing law is boring. That's a bit of a reputation we lawyers drag around with us. But if you deal with these kind of issues, I can assure you that law is not for boring in any way. Now, to give you an example of how I, I do research and how I impact the world, I'll tell you about a book that I published back in uh, 2017. It was on human rights, and I published a book on human rights because there was a debate in Denmark, where I'm originally from, very similar to the debate we now have in the UK, about the human rights and whether or not we should continue to having human rights in the UK to debate of whether or not we want a new bill of human rights, which is going to roll back quite a lot of the protection that we are currently all of us have here in the UK. Now, just like the UK government, the Danish government said that rights interfered with sovereignty. It says that it protects the wrong people and that the European Court of Human Rights interferes too much into domestic politics. Now, so what do you then do when you're a researcher at law? You read a lot of books, you read a lot of judgments and other uh, decisions, and then you try to find out whether or not the critique of human rights is actually justified, as it got hold in reality. Now, what I propose to do is to look at these three arguments in turn. I'm going to be very brief. Of course, the arguments are much more complicated than I make them out here today, but I have a limited amount of time. Now, so one argument we hear in the UK, we hear in Denmark, and we hear in many other countries around the world is that human rights interfere with sovereignty. Now, I would argue that human rights is a, sorry, that sovereignty, sorry, is a very misunderstood concept. So a politician often wants it to mean that they, or the states that they represent, can do whatever they like. Of course, that's not true. And you just have to think about it um, for a little while to see that that cannot be true. Now, instead, one of the more important elements of sovereignty is that all states, the United Kingdom, Denmark, or other countries around the world, is that they are treated as equal. One state values as much as, um, as much as another state. And it means that those states can enter into deals with each other. Now, one such deal that we talk a lot about in the UK at the moment is the European Convention of Human Rights. It's a treaty. It's entered in voluntarily for the 47 states that signed up to it after the Second World War. And what it does is, um, it's not a such an interference with human rights, but it's a deal the states entered into, and therefore a manifestation of their sovereignty. Because if there hadn't been sovereign states, they couldn't have entered into that deal. Now, of course, the deal limits what the states can do. We can't torture, and rightly so, uh, people in the UK anymore because it's prohibited under Article 3 of the European Convention of Human Rights. But again, states signed up for this voluntarily. They knew what they were doing. And I would argue it's not a limitation of sovereignty. Of course, it limits what the states can do, but that's the whole point of the deal in the first place. Now, that's the, the first argument that we always hear. 
Now, the Danish government, and also sometimes we hear this from British politicians, say that human rights protect the wrong people. Um, that should always get you to raise your eyebrows a little. So what does a human rights lawyer do? Well, in the case of Denmark, I read all the cases that's ever been filed against Denmark. I looked at what they were actually dealing with to see if they protect the wrong people, so to say. And we all know who the wrong people are, basically. They are the people that are desperately trying to come to our country, um, maybe uh, sailing in small boats across the channel and arriving on our shores. Now, in the case of Denmark, there has since 1953, when Denmark became a party to the European Convention of Human Rights, been handed in just over about 2,000 complaints. Most of these complaints are just thrown out, basically. They are manifestly um, incompatible with the EU con Convention, and they are not deal dealt with any further. So, since 1953, there's only been about 50 cases that's concerned or that's been dealt with by, by, by the Court of European Court of Human Rights. And of those 50 cases, Denmark has lost 17 cases. So not a huge amount of cases since 1953. And the UK is actually in a similar position. Both Denmark and the UK are the kind of good guys within the system. They have very few complaints raised against them and very, they lose very few cases. So it's a bit kind of ironic that it seems to be both the UK and the Denmark that are kind of leading the fight against the European Convention of Human Rights, especially also when you consider the history, which is that they were some of the ones that initiated the whole system in the first place. Now, if you then look at those cases, so the 17 cases, and I'm doing now the same in relation to the United Kingdom, then you'd also see that unlike the public debate, they don't all concern foreign criminals or asylum seekers trying to come to our countries. The vast majority of cases against Denmark, for example, nine out of 17, concern the right to a fair trial. Now, most of these cases were ordinary people that were suing the governments because they hadn't got compensation for medical negligence, the majority of the cases. Now, of course, other cases, so Denmark has lost a case concerning forced membership of trade unions, which used to be standard practice until the European Court of Human Rights said that that was a violation of human rights. That was a failure to protect the journalist's freedom of expression. He was fined for interviewing some people that had unpopular views, and he put that on television, and the European Court of Human Rights says that was a violation of his human rights. And then we had a case against an old lady that took a bus uh, one day. She didn't have a valid ticket. Um, she was then stopped by the police and asked for her name and address, and she was quite angry that day, and she refused, probably not in her right uh, state of mind either. So the police put her in a prison cell for 13 hours until she would reveal her name. Uh, the fine for this was about eight pounds for going on the bus. So you could say that was disproportional, and that's what the European Court of Human Rights says, and then once again lost a case. So the point that, um, or the, what the fact that I found is that the most of these cases did not actually concern the other people that we don't want to protect, them, but they protected ordinary people with ordinary kinds of complaints. And I think most of us would agree that we don't, wouldn't like to be in prison for 13 hours for the value of eight pounds. Now, this brings me to the last argument, whether or not the European court interferes too much with domestic politics. Now, of course, if you're a domestic politician and you want to decide everything yourself with no limits, then any interference is too much. If, on the other hand, you're an ordinary citizen like everybody in this room and everybody in this country, and you want to have some basic minimum rights, then you might like the fact that there's a group of people in Strasbourg that sometimes tells national governments, no, you can't do that, you went too far. Now, I can mention also some case, famous cases uh, concerning Scotland. For instance, it was fairly regular practice to chastise children in school. A very famous case went to the European Court of Human Rights and said you couldn't smack children in schools here in Scotland. And again, they've got banned all around Europe. In fact, I would argue that many of the rights that we today take for granted, the protection, for instance, against discrimination, um, the fact that we can change uh, our genders, that we can marry a person of the same uh, sex as well. All of these rights basically have been pushed forward by the European Court of Human Rights, and many of them are taken absolutely for granted today. Now, 
that brings me to the end of my presentation. I just want to say that as an academic, and as an academic here at Dundee University, I have a very privileged position because I can sit and I can read about, about this, I can write about this, and I can change the public debate. So does this make a difference? Yes, it does make a real difference. So my book that was published in 2017 was cited several times in the Danish parliament. Parliamentarians actually brought a physical copy of the book and said, these are the 17 cases that Denmark has lost. Is there still reason to change the European Convention of Human Rights or to leave the convention? And the former ambassador to the Council of Europe said that the book completely changed the human rights debate in Denmark. So academics have a real um, possibility and a real privilege in society because we have the time and the place to make these kind of arguments. And of course, not of all of us can make tractor beams. Um, but we can make uh, the difference in a different way. And what I'm going to do in the future is I'm going to look at the Bill of Rights. I am looking at the Bill of Rights because I think we don't need a Bill of Rights. Uh, we have a European Convention of Human Rights that was implemented in 1998. And until now, it's actually worked very well. And that's an argument that I'll be making very forcefully over the next couple of years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jacques. Fantastic talk and uh, real clarity about the need to protect human rights and not to change what we have at the present time. Thank you. That is excellent. So we're going to open this up for questions both in the room and online. So if online you'd like to type your questions in, they will come to me via the side, the side, the side of the room. But we've got two roving microphones, so please put your hand up if you've got a question, but don't ask your question until you have the microphone in your hand, otherwise people online can't hear you. So we have Susie at the back here has a question to start us off. If the rest of you get thinking, we can take other questions thereafter. Susie, welcome. Thank you, Susie Schofield, uh, School of Medicine. Thank you, three ex another three excellent talks. Jacques, um, your history of you know, where you've been, I'm wondering what drew you to Dundee and what particular impact do you think Dundee University will enable you to make in the next stage of your career? Can you just add? Yeah. 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 Well, we're actually a bit of a coincidence, but most of my career has been a bit of a coincidence, I must say. <laughs> um, my wife got a job over here. I applied for a job. I got a job. Uh, and I really like it. Um, we have fantastic <laughs> colleagues, great students. I'm told the weather's the best in Scotland. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but yeah, so a coincidence, and then I really liked it ever since. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yes, here. Thank you. Thank you for all the presentations. They're really good. Very interesting. But this is good, Jack, as well. Um, the pressures on human rights are political pressures, and they're often um, about the way people vote and the way that arguments are made and the, the narrative around those rights and the threats to them. So how, how can someone like you or the work that you do influence the way that people vote or people perceive the threats against themselves so that we don't have the threats against human rights? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so one of the things that I'm trying to do, well, let me take a step back. One of the things I learned when I was researching my book from 2017 was I interviewed a lot of uh, uh, people in general that were participating in the public debate, among other politicians. And I realized that many of the people that were critical of human rights actually had very little understanding of human rights. They would often say, oh, we don't like human rights. I would say, well, tell me a judgment, for instance, that you think has gone wrong. And they could never tell me a judgment. Now, and that made me think about how much also the general public knows about human rights and how important, for instance, education is in elementary schools and high schools and so on. But one of the things I would really like to do in the future, and I'm applying to money to do this, is to do something that they've been doing in political science for years, where they measure what is called political justification. They ask, for instance, can you tell me the name of the prime minister? If you can tell the name of the prime minister, you're more sophisticated than the one that cannot tell you the name. Now, why do I want to do that? because I would like to see if people have a knowledge or sophistication in knowledge of human rights and whether or not that correlates with uh, their views on human rights, because that would be a very interesting argument to make. Now, when I did my research for Denmark, I just did a normal kind of polling of, of people, whether or not we wanted to leave the European Convention of Human Rights. 
many politicians said that human rights were unloved, and the same argument is made here all the time. The public doesn't like human rights, they don't like interference. I did a poll in Denmark where 73% of the Danish population were in favor of staying with the European Convention on Human Rights. Another poll was made by Corinthians on the same day. It's quite a leading question. They asked, if we cannot change the European Convention of Human Rights so that we can deport more foreign criminals, should we then leave the convention? Now, I'm not an expert in polling practice, but that seems to be really bad practice. And still, 53% said no. Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mike Ferguson, Life Sciences. Jack, just, uh, I thought that was a tremendous presentation. and It just struck me it would make a fantastic television program, followed by, a, a, you know, an, an abstracted YouTube program, so it has longevity. So I'm looking again at Rebecca Trengrove, who I always give horrible uh, jobs to, <laughs> to think about that, because it's such an important point, a set of points that, that you made. And, um, yeah, I mean, we, we live in times where the world is being deconstructed in horrible ways. And anything you can do, we, one can do to educate and uh, fight back against some of this terrible reactionary politics that we're living in uh, would be fantastic. So thank you. Yeah. So one of the things that I'm doing, or if I get the funding that I'm now applying for, is I'm trying to find out what the general public does not know about human rights and then educate explicitly on that. Because what we tend to do is have that top-down approach, basically, where we just tell about how fantastic the European Court of Human Rights and how important human rights are. But it might be better to do it from the other way around, saying what are people actually interested? What do they misunderstand? And then focus our teaching on that. There's a question up there. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, um, at the back here, and then we'll come to Trish. And I've got one here. Any questions on sonic screwdrivers or nursing as well? We've focused on human rights so far. Thank you. Sorry, this is just a question about um, nursing and the NHS. Uh, what, in your view, is the answer to recruitment and retention in the NHS? <laughs> <laughs> it's an easy one. So my personal view is that we need to um, be really recruiting high quality students um, from the first instance that Back, way back in schools, even primary schools, be seeing nursing as a positive destination and a profession. And it's very disappointing to see sometimes on Twitter and other social media um, outlets, um, nurses being downplayed as the profession that we are. Um, I was watching something recently where they were saying, why do nurses need a degree? And I was astounded really at having seen all of the media profile of what it is we actually do, that that is still being questioned. Um, so I think early, early recruitment, uh, both for men and women, seeing this as a positive professional destination with huge scope to become advanced nurse practitioners, to become educators um, and, and a, a sort of professional trajectory um, and moving away. Of course, we provide um, the very basics of care, but we also provide highly technical care as well. And I think um, I think that would be my answer. Yeah. Go to Trish next, and then I'm going to do the online question. Thanks. I've got one for, for Jill. Well, thank you all for your presentation. It reminds us, reminds me once again, how important this focus on social purpose is, because all of you, you know, were, were showing in this incredibly diverse pieces, but actually it all has social impact. So, um, Jill, so you, you mentioned that, um, of course, that there were some student nurses that dropped out over the course of the thing. But I'm guessing that there's always a percentage of dropout every year. Do you have any sense of what the difference is? Because I'm slightly wondering, it might just be quite small. Do you have a sense of what the sort of the extraordinary dropout was above, above normal? I, I tried to get some of those figures, but I don't think we've quite looked at how it varied. My, the dean of my school is here, so she may be able to answer that. But how it varied pre-COVID to our, our normal dropout. I think personally, I was more surprised at the years that dropped out. So often they, um, we would lose people in the first year um, when they first go out onto the wards and they actually go, I'm not sure this is for me, the sort of harsh realities of nursing. Um, but we were having people, certainly I started with about 57 and I graduated around uh, 40 in the third year. So um, I don't know how it varied across the years, but maybe Linda Marcy could answer. The microphone to Linda. 
who will try and give us an answer to that. Hmm. Thanks for that lovely, easy question. Um, reten retention is it's a bit of a complex issue in that we do have students who completely drop out, but actually often what happens is we have students who withdraw temporarily so that they'll need to take a break and then they come they come back in. I think um, we in in some ways we were probably surprised during during COVID that we didn't lose more students than we thought. And actually the whole um, kind of we're all in it together, um, you know, feeling at the beginning, especially at the beginning of the pandemic was actually probably quite supportive to, to students. In actual fact, it's probably more of a worry right now. Our first year students have just gone into their first placement at the beginning of this week, and we're really anxious about them, probably more so than we were during COVID, just because of what they're going to find, but also because of the pressure and the, the constant messages that there are in the media at the moment that ha will have an impact potentially on our retention. Also is a worry for recruitment as well. So I think that whole um, th the impact, the kind of political and the media impact for professions like nursing and other professions. I mean, we've heard lots about teaching at the moment, um, medicine, other health professions is, is actually a big concern. And the, and the question about workforce is, you know, it, it's a hugely um, important one. It's probably one of the biggest things that the school executive group um, worries about um, kind of on an ongoing basis. Thank you, Linda. That's great. And I just say that whilst, uh, yes, there were certainly real challenges in nursing, I've just been reviewing the retention progression statistics because we've got to submit those shortly for part of our government submission in, in the spring. And actually our overall retention progression as a university was slightly up during the pandemic period because of the fantastic work that staff did, looking after our students in the best way they could during the pandemic. And it's real testament to them and everything they did. So we're very pleased about that. I'm going to read this online question now, which is from an anonymous person who didn't want to reveal the name. It's for Jacques. It says, have human rights ever really been sincerely believed in rather than just a practical means to assuage post-war guilt and take on a mask at moral superiority? Oh, uh, over to you. <laughs> over to you. I guess it depends on who you ask. Um, They've, they've for once, they've for certain always been controversial, even the UK. Uh, so UK was one of the leading forces behind the European Convention of Human Rights. It's controversial now. Uh, shortly after the Labour government introduced the Human Rights Act in 1998, Tony Blair was unhappy with it because he couldn't do what he was supposed or he wanted to do. Um, so it's definitely always been controversial. Um, Okay. That's probably the best answer. That the best question. answer. Well, thank you to the person online for that question, but that's that's the answer. Any other questions? We've got a couple of minutes left. Oh, Mike's got another question. Oh, absolutely. You're allowed as many as you like. Thank you. This one's for Mike. Mike, Mike Bernard. Super uh, talk, Mike. I just, I mean, I mean, optical tweezers is 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 uh, a mature technology now. Yeah. But I'm just thinking maybe there's a new application for it. You probably noticed in, in Nature and, and Science and those journals, almost every other paper is about uh, spatial transcriptomics, single cell transcriptomics. So now we're defining, let's say, a liver in terms of all the different sub cell types, not based on their morphology anymore, but based on what molecules they're expressing. And we also can then find out where they are in the liver and so on. And so we're now in a position to dissociate all the liver cells identify ones which we know are, are different but are physically close to each other and then on a single cell basis with your optical tweezers bring them into direct acquisition and then study for example Yogesh's um, you know subcellular signaling pathways and so on. I just I, I haven't seen anybody actually doing that but it just strikes me that actually optical tweezers for cell cell um, uh, study m may really be coming of age now rather than when you de first developed it. Yeah, it's the so optical tweezers are, are very much as best when it comes to doing these deterministic sort of small number experiments as opposed to the more statistical big numbers um, biochemistry type experiments there. So that, that would be, I mean, that's, and that's the kind of experiment that has been done quite a lot already in the past of just looking at individual cell cell or cell um, uh, membrane sort of interactions and that kind of thing. So yeah, uh, absolutely. It, I mean, it comes down a little bit to if we're to, talking about measuring forces, for example, what sort of forces they are. But if it's really only about isolation and ensuring that you're only looking at what you need to, then it, 
it should either be possible with optics or we find that if you don't have the forces necessary, then potentially with ultrasound, which is better at more at larger forces and more 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 particles at once, but is less dexterous if you want to sort of do these really sort of refined experiments. Um, so yeah, I, I, you should have a chat. Thank you. And if I could ask you a follow up quick question. You showed a very elegant slide of labelled cell membranes in a chick embryo, and you saw the yeah. cells migrating as as that embryo developed. And really, a was it real time or time lapse? I'm not sure. sorry. That one was over about twelve hours. For about twelve hours. What are the practical applications for the audience of being able to map cell migration in that way? Is it about telling us about different uh, abnormalities of development? So it it would seem strange, but the chick embryo is a particularly good model for human development even more so than some mammalian models, like a, a mouse model, which should be more common. Um, the com most common model is would be zebrafish, simply because it's transparent, which makes all the optics really nice. Chick embryos are very difficult to work with, but are good models for human development. And in particular, we're looking at the gastrulation there, which is this process where we go essentially from a blob where we don't know what each bit of the, of the, the embryo is going to become, to then having a body axis and knowing where the different organs are going to form. And it's, a, and it, if you speak to a developmental physiologist, they'll say that the most important day of your life isn't when you get married or have a child, it's it's gastrulation, it's that day. <laughs> because there are so many different things that can go wrong there. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that's not entirely clear, and it's partially because of sort of the drive, or a lot of life sciences has been driven by the breakthroughs in biochemistry, but maybe less so on the physics side and mechanical side yeah. is what is it that's drive that really is driving these tissue flows, which then lead to the differentiation of different yeah. ty types of, of tissue. Um, so with these huge videos, we're able yeah. to look at things like what is it that's actually creating that? Is it the stresses and strains purely within the, the embryo that's created from processes just like cell division, for example, and is it polarized cell division where all the cells are dividing in one direction and that creates the forces that give you the, the flows? Or is it really just a purely biochemical thing and, and, and signaling between the cells? Or is it a combination? Of course, it's a combination of all yeah. these things, like everything when you get into it, um, which is why we need lots of different people and why I end yeah. up working with lots of different parts of the university. Of like, course, one of the very obvious abnormalities that occurs at that stage is spina bifida when the caudal neural tube doesn't form and you have abnormalities at that point. So you're right, gastrulation probably is the most important <laughs> day of your life. Absolutely. Sorry, my daughter's here. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. OK, so I'm going to finish the questions there, finish the session here and just make a brief announcement. Firstly, thank you to our speakers who have been absolutely fantastic. <laughs> thank you to our audience for fantastic questions and for listening so diligently. For colleagues, Open Research staff will have a stand in the foyer and they're launching their integrated knowledge translation toolkit. So please pay them a visit. But thank you very much, everyone. And thank you for our panel.